Chapter 11, I'll Fly Away. It was the third bomb threat in two months. As we quickly cleared the office and waited for the police to arrive, the entire staff was nervous. We now had five attorneys, an investigator, and three administ administrative staff members. Law students had started arriving for short-term internships, which provided us with an additional legal assistance and critically needed investigative help. But none of them had signed on for bomb threats. It was tempting to ignore them, but two years earlier, an African-American civil rights lawyer in Savannah, Georgia, named Robert Robbie Robinson, was murdered when a bomb sent to his law office exploded. Around the same time, a federal appeals court ju judge, Robert Vance, was killed in Birmingham by mail bomb. Days later, a third bomb was sent into a civil rights office in Florida and a fourth in a courthouse in Atlanta. The bombers seemed to be attacking legal professional professionals connected to civil rights. We were warned that we would be targets, and for weeks we carefully hauled our mail packages to the federal courthouse for x-ray screenings before opening them. After that, bomb threats were no joke. Everyone fled the building while we discussed the likelihood of an actual bombing. The caller had described our building precisely when making his threat. Sharon, our receptionist, had scolded the caller. She was a young mother of two small children and had grown up in a poor, rural, white family. She spoke to people plainly and directly. Why are you doing this? You're scaring us. She said the man had sounded middle-aged and southern, but she couldn't give any more of that description. I'm doing you a favor, he said threateningly. I want y'all to stop what you're doing. My first option is to not kill everyone, so you bet better get out of there now. Next time, there'll be no warning. It'd been a month since the McMillan hearing. The first time the office was threatened to call was threatened, the caller had made racist remarks about the need to teach us a lesson. Around the same time, I got threatening calls at home. One typical caller said, if you think we're going to let you help that get away with killing that girl, you've got another thing coming. You're both going to be dead. Although I was handling other cases, I was certain the calls were in response to the McMillan case. Leading up to the hearing, Michael and I had been followed several times while doing investigative work in Monroe County. A scary man had called me late one night to tell me that someone had offered him a lot of money to kill me, but he said he wasn't going to do it because he respected what we did. I expressed my appreciation for his support and politely thanked him. It was hard to know how seriously to take any of it, but it was definitely unnerving. After we cleared the building, the police went through the office with dogs. No bomb was found, and when the, when the building didn't grow up, blow up after an hour and a half, we all filed back inside. We had work to do. A few days later, I received a different kind of bombshell, this time a call from the clerk's office in Baldwin County. The clerk was calling to let me know that Judge Norton had ruled in the McMillan case. She needed my fax number to send me a copy of the ruling. I gave it to her and sat nervously by the fax machine. When only three sheets of paper came through, the machine was concerned. The pages contained a tersely worded order from Judge Norton denying us relief. I was more disappointed than devastated. I'd suspected that this would be Judge Norton's response. For all his interest at the hearing, he had never seemed particularly engaged over the basic question of whether Walter was guilty or innocent. He was locked into a maintenance role. He was a custodian for the system who, has, who was unlikely to overturn the previous judgment, even if there was compelling evidence of innocence. What was surprising, however, was how superficial, insubstantial, and uninterested the court's two-and-a-half-page order read. The judge arrest, addressed only the testimony of Ralph Myers and none of the legal claims we'd presented or any of the testimonies of the other dozen-plus witnesses. In fact, there was no case law cited in the entire order. Ralph Myers took the stand before this court swore to tell the truth and proceeded to recant most, if not all, of the relevant portions of his testimony at trial. Clearly, Ralph Myers has either perjured himself at trial or he has perjured himself in front of this court. The following areas of concern were considered in reaching this decision. The demeanor of the witness, the opportunity of the witness to have knowledge of the facts which he testified to at the trial, the rationale as stated by the witness for his testimony at the first trial, the rationale as stated by the defendant for his recantation, the evidence of the external pressures brought to bear on the witness prior to and after both trial and recantation, the actions of the witness that led credence to his trial testimony and the actions of the witness and the, that led 
that lend credence to his rec recantation, evidence adduced in the trial in contradiction of the witness's testimony on details, and due to the nature of this case, any evidence from any source concerning the inability of the witness to have known the facts to which he testified to at trial. Since the trial of this matter was conducted before the Honorable R. E. L. Key, Circuit Judge, retired, this court did not have the opportunity to compare the demeanor of the witness during trial testimony and his recantation testimony. A review of the other factors set out above does not provide conclusive evidence that the witness, Ralph Myers, perjured himself at the original trial. There is ample evidence that pressure has been brought to bear on Ralph Myers since his trial testimony, which could tend to discredit his recantation. There is absolutely no evidence in the trial record or the recantation testimony that places Ralph Myers somewhere other than the scene of the crime at the time it was recommitted. This cause have been remanded. This cause having been remanded to the court for the determination of whether there is evidence to support the theory that Ralph Myers perjured himself at the original trial and his court having determined that there is insufficient evidence to support that theory. It is therefore ordered adjudged and decreed that the trial testimony of Ralph Myers is not found to have been perjured testimony. Done this 19th day of May, 1992. Thomas B. Norton, Jr., Circuit Judge. While Chapman had suggested that Myers must have been pressured to recant, the district attorney presented no actual evidence to support that claim, which made the judge's ruling hard to understand. I had advised Walter and his family that we would likely need to go in an appellate court for any real chance of relief, despite how positive everyone thought the hearing had been. I was optimistic about what our evidence might accomplish in the Alabama Court of Criminal Appeals. We were now regularly arguing cases in front of that court. Following my first McMillan argument, he had, we had filed almost two dozen death penalty appeals, and the court was starting to respond to our advocacy. We had won four reversals in death penalty cases in 1990, four more in 1991, and by the end of 1992, we'd won relief for another eight death row prisoners. The court frequently complained about being forced to order new trials or grant relief, but nonetheless ruled in our favor. In a few years, some of the appellate court judges would be attacked and replaced in partisan judicial elections by candidates who complained about the court's ruling in death penalty cases but we persisted and continued raising reversible errors in capital cases. We were pushing the court to enforce the law in these cases, and when they refused, we were having success getting the Alabama Supreme Court and federal courts to grant relief. Based on this recent experience, I thought we could win relief for McMillan on appeal. Even if the court was unwilling to rule that Walter was innocent and should be released, the withholding of exculpatory evidence was extreme enough that the court would have a hard time avoiding the case law requiring a new trial. Nothing could be assured, but I explained to Walter that we are only just now getting to a court where our claims would be seriously considered. Michael had stayed long past the two years he had committed to us, but he was now scheduled to move to San Diego to start a job as a federal public defender. He agonized about leaving our office, although he was left less conflicted about leaving Alabama. I assigned one of our new attorneys, Bernard Harcourt, to replace Michael in Walter's case. Bernard was a lot like Michael as that he was smart, determined, and extremely hardworking. He had first worked with me when he was a law student at Harvard Law School. He became so engaged in the work that he asked the federal judge he was clerking for after law school if he could cut short his two-year clerkship to join us in Alabama. The judge agreed, and Bernard arrived shortly before Michael left. Raised in New York City by French parents, he had attended the Lycée Francois de New York in Manhattan, a high school that was unapologetic about its European perspective on education. After graduating from Princeton, Bernard worked in banking before pursuing his law, law degree. He had been preparing for a traditional legal career until he came down to work with us one summer and became fascinated by the issues that death penalty cases presented. He and his girlfriend, Mia, moved to Montgomery and were intrigued by life in Alabama. Bernard quickly, quick immersion in the McMillan case and testified his cultural adventure more than he could ever imagined. The community's presence at the hearing got people talking about what we had presented in court, and that encouraged more people to come forward with helpful information. All sorts of people were contacting us with wide-ranging claims of corruption and misconduct. Only a few things here and there were useful in our, in our efforts. 
to free Walter, but all of it was interesting. Bernard and I continued to track leads and interview people who had insights to share about life in Monroe County. The threats we received made me worried about the hostility that Walter would face if he was ever released. I wondered how safely he could live in the community if everyone was persuaded that he was a dangerous murderer. We began discussing the idea of reaching out to a few people who might help us publicly dramatize the injustice of, Walt of Mr. McMillan's wrongful conviction as a way of setting the stage for his possible release. If the public could only know what we knew, it might ease his re-entry into freedom. We wanted people to understand the simple fact. Walter did not quit commit that murder. His freedom wouldn't be based on some tricky legal loophole or the exploitation of a techni technicality. It would be based in simple justice. He was an innocent man. On the other hand, I didn't think media attention would help win the court, the case now, pending in the Court of Criminal Appeals. In fact, the chief judge on the court, John Patterson, had famously slewed the, U the New York Times over their coverage of the civil rights movement when he was in Alabama's governor. It was a common tactic used by Southern politicians during civil rights protests. Sue national meeting outlets for defamation if they provide sympathetic coverage of activists or if they characterize Southern politicians and law enforcement officers unfavorably. Southern state court judges and all-white juries were all too willing to rule in favor of defamed local officials, and state authorities had won millions of dollars in judgments this way. More important, the defamation lawsuits chilled sympathetic coverage of civil rights activism. In 1960, the New York Times printed an advertisement titled, Heed Their Rising Voices, that attempted to raise money to defend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. against perjury charges in Alabama. Southern officers, Southern officials responded by going on on the offensive and suing the newspaper. Public Safety Commissioner L.B. Sullivan and Governor Patterson claimed defamation. A local jury awarded them half a million dollars and the case was appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court. In a landmark ruling, New York Times v. Sullivan changed the standard for defamation in libel by requiring plaintiffs to pr prove malice that is, evidence of actual knowledge on the part of the publisher that a statement is false. The ruling marked a significant victory for freedom of the press, and it liberated media outlets and publishers to talk more honestly about civil rights protests and activisms. But in the South, it generated even more contempt for the national press, and that animosity has lingered beyond the civil rights era. I had no doubt that national press coverage of Walter's case would not help our cause at the Court of Criminal Appeals. But I did think getting a more informed view of Walter's conviction and the murder would make his life after release less dangerous, assuming we could ever get his conviction overturned. We felt that we had to take our chances and get the story out. I was concerned about the inability of people in the local government to get a fair picture of what was going on. Aside from the hostility we feared he would face if Walter was released, we were worried about what would happen if a new trial was ordered. All of the prejudicial pre-judicial media coverage would make a fair trial nearly impossible. The local press in Monroe County and Mobile had demonized Walter and had defiantly maintained that his conviction was reliable and his execution necessary. Local papers had painted Walter as a dangerous drug dealer who had possibly murdered several innocent teenagers. Monroeville and Mobile newspapers freely printed out assertions that Walter was a drug kingpin, a sexual predator, and a gang leader. When he was first arrested, local headlines emphasized the absurd sexual misconduct charges involving Ralph Myers. McMillan charged with sodomy was a common headline. In coverage, the hearings, the Monroe Journal focused on the danger Walter posed. Those entering the courtroom had, had to pass through a metal detector, as he had as has that been the case throughout the court proceedings against McMillan. And officers were stationed throughout the courtroom. Despite all of the evidence presented at our hearing showing that Walter had nothing to do with the Pittman murder, the local press invoked the case to scare up more fear about Walter. Convicted Slayer wanted an East Brewtown murder was an early headline in the Brewtown paper. Rhonda wasn't the only girl killed was the headline in the Mobile Press Registry about after our hearing. The Mobile paper reported after the hearing, Myers and McMillan were part of the burglary, theft, forgery, and drug smuggling rings that operated in several counties in South Alabama, according to law enforcement officers. 
McMillan was the leader of the operation. From its focus on his pretrial placement on death row to the extra security surrounding his court appearances, the narrative in the press was clear. This man was extremely dangerous. At this point, people seemed uninterested in the truth surrounding the crime. During the most recent hearing in Baldwin County, the state local supporters walked out of the courtroom rather than hear the evidence that supported Walter's innocence. It was risky, but we hoped that national press coverage of our side of the story would change the narrative. A Washington Post journalist, Walt Harrington, had come to Alabama to do a piece on our work a year earlier and had heard me describe the McMillan case. He passed the information to a journalist friend of his, Pete Earley, who had contacted me and became immediately interested. After reading the transcripts, the files were provided to him. He jumped into the case, spent time with several of the players, and quickly came to share our astonishment that Walter had been convicted on such unreliable evidence. I'd given a speech at Yale Law School, School earlier in the year that was attended by the producer from the popular CBS investigative program 60 Minutes, and he also called me. We got in call from vari- calls from various news ma- magazine programs over the previous few years that expressed interest in covering our work, but I was wary. My general attitude was that press coverage rarely helped our clients. Beyond the general anti-media sentiments in the South, the death penalty was particularly polarizing. It's such a politically charged topic that even sympathetic pieces about people in death row usually triggered a local backlash that created more problems for the client in the case. Even though the client sometimes wanted press attention, I was extremely resistant to media interviews about pending cases. I knew of too many cases where a favorable profile in the media had provoked an expedited execution date or retaliatory mistreatment that made things much worse. We filed our appeal in the Court of Criminal Appeals that summer. With no small amount of lingering uncertainty, I decided to move forward with the 60 Minutes piece. Veteran reporter Ed Bradley and his producer David Gelber came down from New York City to Monroeville on a 100-degree day in July and interviewed many of the people whose testimony we presented at our hearing. They spoke with Walter, Ralph Myers, Karen Kelly, Darnell Houston, Clay Cast, Jimmy Williams, Walter's family, and Woodrow Eichner. They confronted Bill Hooks at his job and conducted an extensive interview with Tommy Chapman. Word got around quickly that news celebrity Ed Bradley was in town, upsetting local officials. Then Monroe Journal wrote, Too many of these out-of-town writers express open scorn for the people and institutions they encounter here, making no more than a superficial effort to gather facts. Worse, a few have been demonstrably inaccurate. We could do without any more news coverage of a big-time reporter comes to a hick town genre. Even before the piece was broadcast, the local media seemed to be urging the communities to distrust anything they heard reported about the case. In CBS Examines Murder Case, a local reporter for the Monroe Journal wrote, Monroe County District Attorney Tom and Chap- Tommy Chapman said he believes researchers for the CBS television news magazine program 60 Minutes had their minds made up before ever coming here. Chapman had taken had taken to using a photo of Walter obtained at the time of his arrest that showed him with long bushy hair and a beard, which Chapman thought made it clear he was a dangerous criminal. The person they interviewed at Holman Prison is not the same person arrested by Sheriff Tate for this murder, Chapman explained. The journal added that Chapman offered CBS the photograph of the real McMillan taken at the time of his arrest, but they were not interested. Prisoners in Alabama are required to remain clean-shaven, so of course Walter looked different when interviewed on camera. When the 60 Minutes piece aired months later, local officials were quick to discredit. The Mobile Press Register headline was DA, TV account of McMillan's conviction, a disgrace. The article quoted Chapman, For them to hold themselves up as a reputable news show is beyond belief and irresponsible. The publicity was characterized as further injuring Rhonda Morrison's parents. The local writers complained that the Morrisons had to worry and deal with the stress that new publicity could lead many people to think McMillan is innocent. The local media was eager to join the prosecutors in criticizing the 60 Minutes piece because it implicated their coverage, which had largely largely presented only the prosecution's theory and characterization of Walter and the crime. 
but people in the community watched 60 Minutes all the time and generally trusted it. Despite the local media reaction, the CBS coverage gave the community a summary of the evidence we'd presented in court and created questions, doubts about Walter's guilt. Some influential community leaders also thought it made Monroeville look backward and possibly racist in a way that was not good for the community's image or efforts at recruiting business, and business leaders started asking tough questions of Chapman and law enforcement about what was going on in the case. People in the black community were thrilled to see honest coverage of the case. They had been whispering about Walter's wrongful convictions for years. The case had so traumatized the black community that many had become preoccupied with each court development and ruling. We frequently got calls from people see simply seeking an update. Some callers sought clarification of a particular point in the case that had been the subject of the serious debate in a barbershop or a social gathering. For, plenty, for many black people in the region, watching the evidence that we had presented in court now laid out in a national television was therapeutic. In the 60 Minutes interview with Chapman, he dismissed, he dismissed as silly the suggestion of any racial bias in Walter McMillan's prosecution. He calmly professed his complete confidence and certainty that McMillan was guilty and that he should be executed as soon as possible. He expressed content for Walter's attorney and people who tried to second-guess juries. We later found out that privately, despite the confidence expressed in his statement to local media and to 60 Minutes, Chapman had begun to worry about the reliability of evidence against Walter. He couldn't ignore the problems in the case that had been exposed at the hearing. Given our success in our death penalty cases, he must have feared the very real possibility of the appellate court overturning Walter's conviction. Chapman had become the public face defending the conviction, and he realized that he'd put his own credibility on the line by relying on the work of local investigators, work that was now revealed as almost farcically flawed. Chapman called Tate, Eichner, and Benson together shortly after the hearing and expressed his concerns. When he asked the local investigators to explain the contradictory evidence we had presented, he wasn't impressed with what he had heard. Not long after that, he formally asked ABI officials in Montgomery to conduct another investigation into the murder confir confirm of Mr. McMillan's guilt. 